Hey guys, Alex here. So in the previous episode, we actually talked about even number theory and parity. So today we would like to talk about how we can actually overcome parity. So this is otherwise known as hyper even number theory. Hey, what's up guys? So as you may have realized, the opening video has basically changed. And I'd like to think of this as transiting into Season 2 of uh, the Othello Academy episodes. Definitely the first uh, 10 episodes are sort of like foundation modules uh, for beginner players to actually learn the game. Probably transit them into a novice player with a little bit more awareness. And of course the next 10 episodes, uh, 11 to 20, would be dedicated uh, to a little bit more uh, difficult and technical uh, terms and uh, skills uh, which are definitely harder to understand so hopefully this uh, season two would actually transit you from a novice player to probably more of an intermediate player so this is in uh, Stockholm over here so I think the last time the World Othello Championship was actually in Stockholm was probably in 2013. That was definitely one of the World Championships that I would have really liked to join. Partly because it was also held uh, within a castle over there. So I thought it would be pretty cool to actually play there. So let's just dive into the topics today. So today's topics are creating even regions. Sui Kuni Trap and Overwhelming Sweeps. So over here you have a picture of me and Sui Kuni Makoto. So basically in the second topic today, Sui Kuni Trap was actually named after him. Uh, Sui Kuni Makoto being a double world champion in 1997 and also 2014. Uh, he's well known as a endgame magician in the, in the game of Othello actually. So let's move on so hyper even number theory is basically ways you can try to counter uh, parity so this is usually applicable for uh, the player playing black which is trying to overcome parity so one of the ways that you can actually overcome parity almost uh, pretty cleanly uh, in the early game or the mid game is to create an even region. So in the previous episode, we actually know that um, if you wanted to protect parity, what you would want to always do is actually play into odd regions instead of even regions. So you basically sort of uh, have the last move or few moves within that region and that would definitely account for a large number of discs. So over here, we have an example of uh, basically black trying to counter parity. So, so the first way we want to talk about is creating even regions. And over here you have black that is actually somewhat walled up uh, for this even region to the top right. And over here you also have the bottom right, which is a two disc region, which is typical of an uh, exchange within a game uh, between black and white and then of course um, with no pass and move you would expect black to be making the next move. So over here since black has already nicely created an even region to the top right for himself where he doesn't have access to, the idea of just basically trying to overcome parity here is to make him uh, pass a move itself. So. Over here, the first move to actually initiate it would actually be black playing h8. So if black were to play h8, white would definitely have no choice but to uh, follow with h7. Because if white doesn't follow with h7 and play somewhere else to the top right, black essentially consolidates those discs to the bottom right. And that is way too many, so, uh, way too many stable discs for black. So when white jumps in, you realize there is actually a pass move. So the reason being is because black does not have a legal move to the top right, which is also probably something that he set up earlier on uh, in terms of trying to form an even region. And at the same time, he probably didn't want to go into the C squares or the X squares early. So over here, since black has passed, you would realize that white is somewhat in a dilemma now that white has lost its natural parity. So white basically has no choice but to try to actually play g1 
hoping that black could would capture the corner so that white could actually wedge quite a number of discs on the diagonal area and also the horizontal. So of course if black were to play here, then uh, the game would probably end a lot closer. But instead, over here black should in fact play g2, being the perfect play move. So over here you can see that the count is 36 black this and 26 white this. So if white were to play h1, it would be a plus 2 minus 1, which would basically give white a 28 this as the final count. And of course, if white were to play h2, black would then complete the game with h1, winning the game from 35 to 29. So let's just go back to that situation here. So basically, over here you realize that because black has created that even region to the top right, he has effectively made himself pass by playing h8 and followed by white's forced h7. So by doing so, he has actually effectively overcome natural parity, um, not really by gaining a move, but actually losing a move on purpose. So this is one of the, the few ways that you can actually try to overcome parity. And of course, uh, this is known as hyper-even number theory, this process of actually creating this even region to the top right. So of course, if black were to not play h8 and were to play h7, for example, white could actually play to h8. And then even though there is a pass of move because white black has surrendered a corner, it becomes easy for white to just sweep the disc down this way and perform almost like a double sweep. And you realize in this sequence, black does not have enough disc to actually win the game. And of course, another way that white could actually feed off uh, and gain back parity is also to play g1 first as a setup move. And black would have to play either h1 or g2. It doesn't matter which one black plays, but of course, you would expect black to take the corner as a defensive one. And white would then capture h8. And black would then be forced with the only move to g2. And white would complete the move or the game with h2 and basically still win the game. So over here, it does matter where black plays. So it is important that you understand the principles and how to make use of this even region that you have created and play a force move over here. And of course, you might argue that if white doesn't play this and tries to play g1 over here instead, perhaps you could preserve parity, yes. But instead of actually uh, you know, uh, surrendering parity, uh, he actually surrenders quite a number of stable discs which black would then jump in here and capture it. And if white were to play the best move, which is probably h2 here, black would then simply consider these two options, plus 2, minus 2, or plus 2, minus 1. And then obviously black would go into h1, which is plus 2, minus 1, and still win the game. So essentially, it is critical for you to understand uh, how you can actually form up such a region and then force a move and basically make yourself skip a move. So that is uh, creating even regions. So in the earlier topic, we actually covered about creating even regions and how that can actually make yourself skip a turn and how that can actually help you overcome parity. So over here, we would like to talk about the Sukuni trap. So the security trap is basically um, trying to make yourself skip a turn as well um, as black, knowing that you don't have a natural parity. You basically try to win back parity in that sense. Instead of trying to actually just create an even region, we actually try to create an odd region over here, which is usually with a backing of uh, probably your own corner. So that gives uh, your opponent uh, lesser of an option to actually just feed off the edges to try to gain parity. So over here it is actually Black's turn to play. As you can see that uh, it's a total of six squares remaining. And Black would definitely go for h8 instead of just surrendering the corner. But uh, if Black goes for h8, so the shape that you want to take note of is actually this bottom left uh, three square region. It is an odd region that White can actually jump into first. However, over here, after black has actually uh, obtained corner, white would actually jump into g8 for the wedge. 
So if white jumps in to g8 for the wedge, and black takes g7 in response, which is the only move he has, you would realize that white, although has the first move to this odd region on the bottom left, it is most likely that he would actually capture the corner and result in a pass. So this, even though it's an odd region that was blocked off by black to try to make himself skip a turn, in fact, he gives white only option to actually jump into a8, and that would actually result in a pass because there is no legal move for black over here. And you would then realize that regardless of where white played, there wouldn't be sufficient this for white to actually win the game. So of course, a7 over here is the best move, and you would then see that white loses by 8 discs. So let's just move back a little bit. So over here, if white chose not to play a8, for example, and chose to play maybe a7, black would then capture the corner, and white would essentially lose even more. And of course, if white were to choose to play b7, black would then capture the corner to a8, and white would still lose the game. So over here, you can see that this shape is actually called a Suikuni trap, whereby you sort of force white to go into the corner, and then you make yourself skip a turn so that you can recapture parity over here. So usually this is the case when you have the backing of a corner over here, and probably a strong backing of the edge over here. This is also another way to actually overcome parity, or basically carry out hyper-even number theory. So if we just go back to the earlier position, so Another way that you can actually try to retain parity for white is to play b7 instead of g8 here. So when white chooses to play b7, black basically plays to a8, and white would then jump into a7, and then finally black would have no choice but to take g7, and then white would capture the last move and retain parity to g8. However, over here, since black... Uh, still has that overwhelming lead, he still manages to edge out a win. So in the first two points, we actually talked about how black can actually gain back parity by actually skipping his own move on purpose or just making himself pass. So in the third point over here, we would like to talk about overwhelming sweeps, where parity may not actually win you the game, as long as you are able to establish sufficient stable discs uh, under certain force moves. So over here in this sequence, we would like to actually just give an example for overwhelming sweeps. So in this board situation, you can tell that they are basically split into three areas where that they are all even regions. So no matter where black plays, white will then just follow. So in essence, you know that white uh, definitely retains parity. So there is no way that you can actually just sort of try to come up with a smart move and try to overcome parity. Now the discount is actually pretty equal, 29-29. If you would like to win the game, you definitely need to consider the flow of the game and which region you would actually like to start with. So over here, you'd like to consider where to play, uh, which makes sense uh, according to the flow of the game, and to actually just try to win the game without parity, knowing the fact that you are not able to capture parity anymore. So if you look at the open discs that are still up for grabs for black to perform overwhelming sweeps, you would then be able to tell that uh, this is probably one of the main rows, which is a 5 disc row. And of course, this, the second row over here, uh, which is potentially a 5 or 6 this row, uh, you can probably sweep that up. If you do start from the top right region, you allow white to consolidate that position uh, because H2 would then be stable. And then there is no way that you can actually sweep the second row. So what you would like to do for the top uh, row is to actually go from left to right instead of right to left. So you probably want to start off with B1 and force white to just respond to b2 and then sweep the disc across by performing g2 and white captures h2 so essentially white still maintains parity but because of the overwhelming sweeps that you're performing you can actually gain uh, enough number of stable discs potentially 
So over here, you, the last two squares, you would then consider a plus 5 minus 3, which gives you an aggregate of plus 2, or plus 7 minus 4, which gives you an aggregate of plus 3 with H7. So obviously, H7 is the choice that you'd like to make, and you would perform one last sweep on this row. And even though you do lose parity, you actually still win the game. So when you're given a situation whereby you have quite a few empty squares, it is important to actually understand the flow of the game, whether you want to go from left to right or right to left or top to bottom or bottom to top. So that flow actually matters quite a lot in terms of how you like to end the game. And definitely the corner may not be the best move for sure. So there are situations whereby the corner may not be the best for sure, but instead probably a C-square that gives you an overwhelming sweep and more stable discs. So on that note, I'd like to end off this episode on hyper-even number theory, and I'll see you in the next episode.